All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. I'm Dr. Srinjoy Bose, Senior Lecturer in Politics and International Relations at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, and I will be chairing today's discussion. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we live and work, pay respect to elders past and present, and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, and recognize that sovereignty was never ceded. I'm joining you today from Gadigal land. Please feel free to identify the lands on where you are, are working and living in the chat section. Friends, we gather here today under somber circumstance, precarious and perilous for many of our Afghan friends. A 20 year democratic and state building project in Afghanistan has come to a most unceremonious end. Following a precipitous and woefully unplanned withdrawal, the Taliban once again rule Afghanistan. Many Afghans, in Afghanistan and elsewhere, feel a profound sense of betrayal and fears abound. The breakneck speed of the, Talib of the Taliban uh, onslaught following US troop withdrawal sent shivers down Afghans' spines. Reports of intimidation, slaughters, executions and reprisals against civilians are on the rise. The danger of genocide and politicide is real. What happens when the world's attention shifts away from Afghanistan? What can the international community, including Australia, do to preserve some of the pre precious gains made over the last 20 years? What can they do to ensure the protection of civilians, many of whom have been stalwart allies in the democratic state building project, as the Taliban maneuver to take the reins of power? This webinar brings together a group of internationally recognized Afghan scholars and practitioners, scholars of Afghanistan, to present their views and insights on the latest developments in Afghanistan. Between them, they have over 120 years of academic and professional experience working on and in Afghanistan. The webinar is intended both to inform the audience and help mobilize urgent collective action in support of securing the most vulnerable and at-risk persons in Afghanistan. In terms of the structure of today's webinar, we will split the speakers into two panels. I will introduce the first panel of speakers and facilitate a roundtable discussion. This will be approximately 25 minutes and will be followed by a 30-minute question and answer session. At the end of the first Q&A, I will introduce the second panel of speakers and repeat the process. During the Q&A sessions, audience members will be able to use the chat function, the Q&A function, apologies, to ask uh, their questions. The link will be on the bottom of your screen. So without further ado, I'd like to present and introduce to you the first panel. Uh, the first group of panelists include uh, Professor William Maley, Emeritus Professor of Diplomacy at the Australian National University and author of the books, The Afghanistan Wars and Transition in Afghanistan, Hope, Despair and the Limits of State Building. We have Dr. Omar Sharifi, Assistant Professor in the Social Sciences and Humanities at the American University in Afghanistan. And finally, Ms. Farhonda Akbari, who is a research scholar at the Korobel School of Asia Pacific Affairs, the Australian National University and is conducting a project comparing the Taliban in Afghanistan and the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia as diplomatic actors. Welcome panelists. Bill, I might start with you. Um, given the title of today's webinar, can you explain the terms politicide and genocide I, and identify why these are urgent and pressing topics and issues of discussion? Yes, thank you, Srinjoy. Uh, the reason that I think these are urgent and pressing topics is that there is a history in this respect. In August 1998, the Taliban carried out a massacre of 2,000 Hazaras in Mazari Sharif in just three days, which the Pakistani writer Ahmad Rashid in his book Taliban described as genocidal in its ferocity. And this comes on top of a long history in Afghanistan, stretching right back to the 1978 communist coup of mass 
political violence and mass atrocity crimes being used by regimes as ways of trying to secure their positions. And there's actually a large and very distressing volume of scholarly literature which deals with this. It's also the case, however, that both from international law and from scholarly research, we have high quality material on which we can draw both for an understanding of the nature of genocide and politicide and the kind of factors that might be risk factors that flag warnings so that if there is a risk of uh, mass political killings taking place in a particular polity, countries in the wider world can anticipate the danger and put in place mechanisms to try to respond to the problem. The term genocide was coined by Raphael Lemkin, uh, who was horrified by what uh, the Holocaust told to the world about the possibility of mass killings. Uh, and it was he who was the entrepreneur who really led to the adoption in 1948 of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. And that has two elements which are important in it. One is the definition of genocide and the other is an identification of acts which can be punishable under the convention. The, the definition of genocide in the convention uh, covers um, any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial or religious group, such as killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group or forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Now, this is actually an important definition because it embraces a lot more than people might think. Uh, it doesn't require that um, we simply discuss killing. It also refers to causing serious bodily or mentally harm. And it doesn't refer to an intent to destroy all of a group. It can cover uh, an intent to destroy a group in part. So uh, there are reasons to think that it should not just be limited by an understanding of historical cases like the Holocaust or the Rwandan genocide or the Khmer Rouge genocide in Cambodia, but actually applies to circumstances that can arise in other circumstances. Um, it's also the case that not only genocide is punishable, but under Article 3 of the Convention, an attempt to commit genocide or complicity in genocide. So uh, there are reasons to think that scrutiny uh, des designed to ascertain culpability in this sphere should go beyond just killers who may have machetes or guns or whatever, and also capture people who might be um, unsuccessful in their endeavors to commit genocide or who are complicit as part of a command structure which uh, leads to genocidal activities. Now, um, th the less common word in our seminar today is politicide. And that is a term which was coined by um, two social scientists in the United States, Barbara Half and Ted Gurr, uh, to discuss um, circumstances in which um, one moves beyond ethnic, religious or national groups as potential targets. For them, a politicide uh, has victim groups which are defined primarily in terms of their hierarchical position or political opposition to the regime and dominant groups. So political opponents can be the targets of a politicide. Uh, and as we know from some historical cases, this can lead to very substantial mass atrocity crime as well. Now, as we've also seen, there have been some very gruesome episodes in the last few months in the run-up to the Taliban's takeover of Kabul. And this should serve as a warning to be wary of swallowing too readily uh, the public relations ideas that might be uh, disseminated at press conferences in Kabul. These are rarely a good guide to the way in which regimes with a repressive agenda are dis disposed to behave. A better guide can be found in the academic literature, which has actually used historical uh, and uh, quantitative analysis to identify key risk factors. And again, uh, Professor Half is a major contributor here, and she's identified six factors which are particular warning signs of the risk of genocide or politicide, and uh, which, when they come together, create a combustible situation. And those factors are, firstly, the magnitude of prior political upheavals. If you had a disordered situation, that's a risk factor. 
Experience of prior genocides or politicides, also a risk factor. The existence within an elite of an exclusionary ideology. Uh, the existence of an autocratic regime that's not democratic, pluralistic, or participatory. Um, an elite based almost entirely on an ethnic minority, and then relatively level, levels of international interdependence. And what's alarming right now is that the current situation in Afghanistan ticks quite a lot of these boxes. So whilst these are probabilistic rather than deterministic factors, they do justify our looking at this particular problem right now with considerable care, because as we can see, the international community is on its way out. Once the international community is gone, I would expect that there will be active measures to try to repress the flow of information about what's going on in Afghanistan. And that uh, gives rise to a very dangerous moment indeed. So let me conclude on that point. Thank you, Bill, for that a very comprehensive uh, response to the question. I think this whole opens up uh, the round table uh, for other participants to join in. Omar, if I may turn to you, um, Bill has identified uh, some risk factors. Bill also spoke about uh, the Taliban in terms of uh, attempts to commit uh, abuses and crimes, um, their complicity and their culpability in past crimes and anticipating such crimes in future. Bill also mentioned there is a need to anticipate these dangers and risk factors. Recently, uh, over the past 48 to 72 hours, some male foreign journalists uh, in Afghanistan and, and elsewhere are reporting that this is the safest they have felt in years in Kabul and elsewhere. So my question to you is, First, is this the experience of Afghans? Do Afghans actually feel safe on the ground? And second, can you identify some of the key developments on the ground and potential areas of concern with regard to the risk of politicide and genocide? Well, thank you, Dr. Sanjoy. Um, I was actually reading about that days, uh, some of the journalists wrote that they are feeling very safe. Um, obviously, because nobody's doing an attack, nobody's bombing, nobody's shooting. Um, I mean, the Taliban are no longer shooting at themselves or something, obviously. So it's just, um, it's very ironic when I hear that. But when, um, and at the same time, it's sort of a little bit tragic because the only voice that's missing in the whole sort of idea of like what's safe and what's not is like how the Afghan people's people actually feel and do. And I think a glimpse at the airport or the glimpse at the city or the glimpse at what's going on in other parts of the country, and it shows that, the, I mean, many, many, for many, many Afghans, the idea of being safe and secure is a very, very, it has a very different interpretation, I have to say. But in terms of the Taliban and how they perhaps sort of, they're committing politicide and something else. Like I, um, I have to, um, I mean, I know that I have five minutes. So to me and to all of us, at least to us who actually lived under the Taliban, from the past and actually for the last 20 years kind of went through every stage of the evolution of the Taliban from Pakistan and come back from leaving Afghanistan to Pakistan, coming back from Pakistan and stuff. We're not, and also this kind of a blitzkrieg that's going on in terms of media that shows that the Taliban has evolved and stuff. I believe um, that it's all based on its presumption that the Taliban is monolithic entity made of one group and that group has actually made decisions or something else. But what actually seeing in Kabul are actually what we have experienced in the last 20 years is the Taliban are actually made of different groups. And these groups, some of these groups actually completely operate um, independently. Now, they also tie the Taliban in terms of like culture or religion and everything to Afghanistan and say it's like whatever, maybe these groups are different, but at the same time, given that they have this sort of the same root, therefore, in terms of religion or culture or whatever they call it, um, therefore, they, there's a possibility for them to evolve. But for all of us who live in Afghanistan actually experience it first hands, we, the Taliban, in my opinion, is just not a, um, it's not just simply a traditional group, it's not simply a jihadist group, it is a, um, a, an ideological movement. 
and being very closely allied, whether it's all your ideological brethren in South Asia, Central Asia, and Middle East, and all the jihadi groups like in Pakistan, North Central Asia, and other places. And their, their mentality is very clear, and their ideas are very clear. So maybe some soldiers in the Taliban lower ranks may don't have an idea. Maybe some members who are like in quite a short or Peshawar or Waziristan may think differently. But at least what if we look at the Taliban very objectively, that's from its evolution in 1994 all until now, they remain very committed to what they have. It's a kind of a part of an ideological international jihadist group that in a way does not recognize much of the sort of these values, ethics, and laws, international laws that is um, accepted by everyone else. Because if they did, they would have never sort of driven out in the first place in 2001, or they've given some but not. And today, I think, if you look very carefully of every single statement they've made about their associations with all these different groups, it's just, they're the same. They say we are the same and stuff. Now, will they probably gonna change or, something in Evolve, the Taliban are facing one different, something in Afghanistan, I have to say different from in the course of our history. And that is a population of actually now used to level of services, to health, to school, to internet, to being respected, to freedom of speech, to actually women's working and stuff. And for that Taliban, that will actually be a test. I don't wanna be very deterministic. There will be a test to show how the Taliban will actually behave. And so far, because they haven't announced their governments and they're continuing fighting and stuff, and especially now we know that a lot of these jihadists from Pakistan, Lashkar Taiba, and all these groups moved in Afghanistan the last three, four days. Now some of them even moved to um, Kabul, and that the Haqqanis are now in charge of the, the security of Kabul and other major areas. I, I will say I will bet on the fact that it's an ideological group. They're going to continue to push in as much as how much they say that they evolved, they've changed, they might present them sort of like more modern face of it. But, to, but I think for the Taliban, modernization has a very different, different interpretation. That means they are more jihadists, they are more connected with the, and probably they are more even violent. So in terms of politicide, in terms of genocide and stuff, I'd expect them to happen again. It's already happening. And I think any sort of like whitewashing it and stuff, turning it into something that more kind of really like, like something that is very, very complicated, turned into a simple thing. I think that was our curse for the last 20 years. It brought us to this stage lack of understanding and sort of simplifying things is actually quite complicated and um i'm not going to bet on that fact that they they, they we are, we're not dealing with that potent, not potential but absolute possibility of a politicide um, um possibility of a genocide and also um destruction of much values and ethics that afghans have come to believe in the course of their history and especially loss experience it in the last 20 years Thank you for that. Uh, well, I shouldn't really say thank you for that sobering analysis, uh, Omar, but I think you've given us material to interrogate a little bit more. And I think it's the perfect opportunity to bring in Farhonda to dialogue with some of what Omar has, be, has identified. Um, Farhonda, Omar touched on, and um, you know, the, the, the uh, Taliban's essentially PR campaign over the past 18 to 24 months, uh, but he also, and, and the effect that is happening in terms of uh, uh, diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis the US and other partners. Uh, uh, Omar also touched upon important questions uh, that we need to get evidence of, have they changed? Have the Taliban changed? What evidence do we have to suggest that uh, um, uh, uh, they are going to stick to their word now, et cetera, et cetera. But the questions that I have for you now, uh, based on what Omar has said is, what can you tell us uh, about the Taliban's cohesiveness as a movement and an organization and why understanding the Taliban's cohesion is important for implications uh, in, uh, uh, in anticipating the dangers of genocide and politicide. Thank you, Dr. Bose, um, uh, and um, uh, good afternoon to all the participants today. Building what um, Bill says and, um, uh, and, and Sharif said, I would, going back to answer your question, um, the Taliban organization um, 
have been praised for their cohesion as an insurgency and fighting and surviving under great pressures, um, paying very high casualties. Uh, but um, that's when the Taliban were fighting a war. However, I think uh, caution has to be made about Taliban's cohesion um, at this new chapter that we have entered in the last one week, that now they're going to rule Afghanistan. Uh, when the pressure for survival is lifted um, and, and different groups and networks that operated under the Taliban may defect or may continue to take revenge, um, committing mass atrocity crimes and targeting uh, vulnerable groups in Afghanistan. Um, and, uh, uh, the two previous speakers before me have been countering that, but I would go more into details about um, uh, Taliban um, as an organization entity. Um, the movement has had a two dimensions, hierarchical and in its leadership and quasi-autonomy horizontally um, to operate its military. And the horizontal structure of the movement, um, it, it, they have been operating with a greater degree of autonomy. They, it, it began with their commission um, followed by field commanders and shadow governors and foot soldiers. In the autonomous experience of the commanders during the war in the last 20 years, other pockets were created based on personal interests operating for different purposes, forms um, forming local rivalries uh, to family grievances, the drug mafia, resource smuggling, and there are so many other, uh, other layers to that. But in addition to the network of the Taliban, um, there are also, um, as Dr. Sharif mentioned, regional international terrorist organizations that have been operating in Afghanistan, and most of uh, which have been nourished and, uh, and endured in, 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 in the areas that have been under the Taliban's control. So the question is how the Taliban are going to manage all these different groups and network while governing uh, with authority. And, uh, with, and now I think they can't be secretive as an insurgency, uh, but, uh, but rule uh, to a degree of transparency uh, uh, having um, the danger of mass atrocity crimes are there, um, uh, even if the Taliban movement successfully turned itself from an insurgency, from a hardcore military organization to a political entity in its entirety and, and, and having all the layers of it with it together to evolve in this transition. There are still risks that um, groups, factions, layers, as mentioned earlier, that were operating under the brand of the Taliban, under the umbrella of the Taliban, uh, would turn violent harm, harm um, civilians um, and, and, and particular uh, particular groups. But in the, in the last uh, few years, we have witnessed uh, different patterns of attack against civilians. I mean, civilian casualties have always been there, but we have been noting um, a different, different, different sort of different typology of attack against civilians. And I just share a few quick examples for us to sort of capture this whole um, uh, ambiguity about different layers, different network. One example would be in the last uh, two months, especially since the Taliban took control of the major parts of the country, we saw inconsistencies in the way of ruling and, and the crime that were committed. There are forced marriages uh, with girls, um, killing of uh, minority groups, uh, burning public infrastructure. The Taliban leadership, the one who have access to media and talk to the international, they deny these crimes. Um, but the question is, is it the was it the Taliban's strategy of denial or, or the Taliban leadership uh, leadership really lacked um, to control, have a control over its fighters and commanders. And the second example would be um, looking back at the so-called peace process. Um, the reason that the Taliban haven't been able to really compromise much um, in the process mainly was that it, it, they were not able to sell it to their commanders and fighters, fearing that defection and backlash would happen. Um, commanders and foot soldiers are the extreme end of the Taliban spectrum ideologically. Um, they are very rigid, uh, driven by propaganda, by revenge and by hatred. But how would the Taliban leadership pacify these fighters now uh, in the long run um, uh, who have been fed with this propaganda against the very civ civilians or particular civilians
suggest that they're now going to rule, especially targeting people who work with the government, who went to universities, who are educated, um, and, and also, of course, women and minority groups. And a third example, and the last one that I would share, is that Taliban have been using um, um, other countries' terrorist groups as a leverage over recognition and as a pressure tool um, um, on others. A recent example is the Tajikistani militant group uh, who were put in charge of the five northern districts uh, sharing border with Tajikistan, just to signal to Tajikistan for the price that they would pay if any military operation was going to be initiated in support of the then Afghan government. Um, these are just, this is just one of the examples, but there are other, other militant groups that the Taliban have been using as a leverage over the regional countries. Um, uh, and, and if any recognition to the Taliban come, it might start from the region just because that, that fear is there for them. Um, uh, and, and rhetorically, the Taliban itself as an insurgency um, endured violence. They took control of the whole country through violence. That's why Taliban is an inspiration and a model for other ideological and insurgent organizations regionally and uh, internationally. Um, to conclude, uh, coming back to the risk of civilians, vulnerable groups face threats for their gender, their ethnicity, uh, their sense of liberty or, or what they believe in, um, and they're much, much more vulnerable today with having these sort of different layers and different groups operating. Um, internationals are uh, shifting their focus. And would the Taliban leadership be able to control all of this or not, even if we believe that Taliban itself or the, the core of it would have an intention to, to protect civilians. Um, I will stop here, but happy to come back. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Fahonda. Um, I realize we're pressing on in time. So before I get to the uh, Q&A session, I've, and I've been receiving a few questions from the audience already, I might just want to press you, uh, uh, Fahonda, on this idea of command and control a little bit, more, but I'd like Omar and Bill to jump in as well. Um, we know, perhaps on account of the uh, recent ceasefires we have witnessed, that the Taliban can you that, that they can wield violence almost by turning the tap on and off. If they want to escalate violence, they just have to turn the tap on. If they want to stop it from happening, as we saw during the ceasefires, they have the capacity to rein their fighters in. I suppose then my question is, if it is a question of command and control, then if we do see escalations in mass atrocity and human rights abuses, can we reasonably presume that this was a, a, a concerted effort by the Taliban leadership, by their commanders at upper echelons uh, uh, to undertake uh, uh, such crimes? Um. To coming uh, to your question on ceasefire and how I I I, I think I, I what I captured from what you mentioned is if if the if the leadership has can turn the tap on and off. Um, we have to understand that cohesion and that command and control during the war and during an insurgency when there's there's threat for survival is different when that pressure is lifted because threat for survival would be something to glue them together and 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 while they were operating under under great great pressure and their line was quite straightforward whereas now that they are the victors they are the conquerors they rule the country and how much they can really th that pressure is not then that's when that internal dynamics and that factionalism can can sort of um, emerge and and we have there these are all the questions i think we it, it's too early to tell but the examples that i shared was as uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the sort of scene that we have seen that can tell us about, about the future of that command and control. Uh, so enjoy on this particular question, I think it's important to differentiate, but value two different understandings of responsibility. One is causal responsibility and the other is command responsibility. It may well be the case that uh, crimes are carried out by people from within the Taliban without the Taliban leadership having necessarily ordained that from 
uh, wherever they finally decide to locate their capital. But uh, the notion of command responsibility, which uh, has developed um, in law of, as well as in ethics, identifies the importance of holding um, senior leaders um, responsible, even if they may not have given particular commands. And this is where the notion of complicity under the Genocide Convention comes into play. It's, it's, it's the reason why General Yamashita was executed after the Second World War, because although there was not direct evidence of his having been involved in uh, the specific crimes which were uh, brought before the tribunal, it was absolutely clear that he was the commander of the force that had carried out these particular crimes. So when you actually claim to be the leadership of uh, a state structure, then those who are your shock troops become a kind of sticky commodity, really. You uh, end up carrying a command responsibility for what they have done. And it's actually very important to drive home the point that command responsibility as well as, well as causal responsibility comes into play in these circumstances. Otherwise, we'll be awash with Taliban leaders who will go, oops, I didn't know about that. But that's not a good enough response. Sure, thanks for that, uh, uh, colleagues. I might turn to now, uh, I might turn to uh, the audience's questions and I'm trying to group together some of these questions in, in terms of themes. Um, if it's all right with you, we might take three questions at a time, if that's all right. Um, so we have three questions over here. Uh, um, I'll, I'll identify them and then you can uh, uh, respond to them one at a time or in a thematic manner. I'm not going to be identifying um, a, the audience members' names uh, because there might be safety issues uh, 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 that they are concerned of. So I'll just ask the questions. Um, the first question is, as a consequence of the commission or omission of acts, how would you define the enablers of a genocide or politicide? Are elements of the international cul community culpable here? The second question is what potential is there for a multi-sided civil war as that happened between 92 uh, and uh, uh, the coming of uh, the Taliban to power and indeed beyond that? Does that raise additional risks of genocide and politicide? Uh, and a third question uh, is, do you think it is too early to pass judgment about the Taliban's future conduct and what sort of government could actually be formed in Kabul? I'll start with those three questions. Well, just briefly on the first question there, I think the distinction between causal responsibility and command responsibility does help us in answering that particular question. That there's no doubt that the maladroit diplomacy of international actors has been causally responsible in significant ways for the unraveling that we've witnessed uh, and uh, that uh, we probably wouldn't be staring at the disaster that's now on, uh, on our doorstep if it hadn't been for decisions made by uh, President Trump and President Biden. That's dif different from saying that they could be um, uh, charged with command responsibility for what um, uh, crimes might end up being committed by Taliban within Afghanistan. It, it's a similar problem with, say, linking the diplomacy of Neville Chamberlain in the late 1930s to uh, the Holocaust. There's, there is a causal responsibility of sorts there, but you couldn't actually uh, uh, impute any kind of command responsibility from which direct uh, culpability would flow. Omar Faranda, would you like to respond? Well, I, I, I can add on, on, on this fact that, uh, maybe it's, is it too early to pass judge on Taliban and stuff? And I know I'm talking about with a great risk at my, to my family. I mean, I managed to, to get hit in one of the last flights to Delhi and with an absolutely no idea what would be the future and stuff, but at least it's, I see my ethical responsibility to be very clear about what I've seen and what I, so is it too early to pass judgment on the Taliban, they may not. Well, that depends on how you look at that. If you look at it from, for instance, an international perspective or a regional perspective, you see just a group of militants, jihadists, 
who go around, conquer a place with the people who have been at war for a very long time. And you say that's their nature. Uh, maybe we have to give them a chance to build something or establish something. Maybe they have, they, they have transformed and evolved in something. Or you can look at it from an Afghan perspective. For us who actually lived and grew up under the Taliban and Mujahideen, their predecessors, and stuff. And we saw our country being destroyed. Our cultural heritage is completely wiped out. Our schools, museums, universities, um, uh, monuments, everything was destroyed. Our economy was looted. We saw that the women were beaten. We see that still being beaten. We see that uh, our children are not allowed to go to school and they are still not allowed to go to school because they are women. We see that a man's honor and respect and dignity is being challenged because he just had to share his beer. We see that our entire history was just simply denied and everything began with some sort of a specific ideological understanding of it. We saw that everything that we stand and stood for is challenged, destroyed, humiliated. So that depends from these two different perspectives how we see it, at least for me, when I see that and when I say, is it too early to pass judgment? It, to me, it's like, well, I can forgive, for instance, okay, you destroyed Buddhist Rupanya. You denied the entire generation for, for education. You gens, you massacre thousands of people just because they looked a certain way or they were like, following a specific sort of uh, section of it, sector in Islam and stuff. But what matters for me is that, I mean, at least in our language, we just say what happened in the past is actually can be sort of a light to give you a future. I don't see a change in Taliban. Taliban a spokesperson come talking to TV and says, we're going to build a broad-based government. And then you see all the appointments, Haqqani Network, you see the Lashkar Taiba, you see all the jihadists coming. They say that we're going to allow the girls to go to school, but only until the grade six to go to schools. We say that we're gonna, we, we're gonna bring security, but that actually, um, um, it just brings fear. So to conclude all of it from that, at least to know how the Taliban acted before, and to be honest, to just give the people a benefit of the doubt for today and what's going on today. The conclusion is when you look and kind of think about the possibility of what type of government, kind of Taliban will rule or something, Taliban and Talibanism, and it, kind of is more about ruling rather than governing. And because the inability for them to govern, the inability even to think as a governing, because nothing, there is absolutely no evidence, rather there's in terms of manifesto or a white paper or something that just shows how they're gonna run the education system, how they're gonna help the agriculture sector, how they're gonna build the economy and stuff. It, and what we've seen today in terms of that, they just they go tax people to death, collect the things, take take the deny the girls to go to school. It has been, it all it, it is and has been, and I believe it will be mostly about ruling and extracting of the resources rather than actually giving human dignity up on So it just if I can put it in that way. Thanks, Dr. Sharifi. Can I quickly just uh, add uh, a couple of points uh, on that? Uh, we have been living with the Taliban in the last 20 years, uh, in post-2001 as well. So there were territories under Taliban control, and they have had their own uh, governing sort of structures and shadow governors and, 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 and uh, operated under um, uh, at the areas that they were controlling and the sort of services they provided or so and, and how they behaved and what happened. So it is not that over a night miracle would happen and the Taliban would change, but uh, that's one uh, there we have, a, we have a history with them. Um, but other point is that the way in which the Taliban came back to power controlling the entire country since last Sunday uh, and the way that uh, they concurred or, or, or used violence to make their way through also tells us about uh, the loss of leverage over the Taliban and any change that were hoped to be brought upon them or upon their ruling if there was um, some sort of um, power sharing or a peace settlement in place um, with them. Um, uh, once that is off the table, um, once they come back as concurrents, I think there are limited leverage on, on, on making any change. And, and we diplomatic engagement with the Taliban in the last 
uh, two years especially, um, there has not been any substance to show us that the Taliban would be any different uh, from the past. Yes, they have evolved uh, very well uh, in their communication, in their use of uh, technology, and also their um, diplomatic strategies uh, uh, using uh, uh, things with um, a, a states, uh, but at the same time, um, uh, when it comes to that ideological side of the Taliban, to the ruling side, um, uh, they're a lot more emboldened. And that's why those risks that we are highlighting today um, are really there. Another point on the civil war, um, Afghans are tired of war. This is something we have been hearing and, 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 and there, are, there are genuine um, fatigue there. Um, uh, the, the fact that other, other groups, other factions or other political parties in Afghanistan are uh, sort of uh, disarmed right now. And at the same time, other countries um, engagement with the Taliban uh, limits that, that risk. In a way, the good side is that if there is not civil war, less anarchy, that way it will, there, there might be less harm to civilians. Um, but yeah, I mean, potentially right now, um, uh, 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 that risk is lower, but, uh, but it all depends really how the Taliban would unfold itself politically and the sort of government they put in place and, and how the people will be able to remobilize themselves again. And, and also the whole political parties, the region is involved international, um, other countries are involved. Um, it, it's hard to, to, to say more about that at this point. Thank you. Yeah, Swinjo, if I could just make one comment on that point and follows what uh, Omar Sharifi was saying. I think there is a danger when one looks at quite extreme groups to think that they can't be ex as extreme as, that, as their own statements would suggest they are. Uh, and this was a problem in Germany in the 1930s. And uh, uh, I'd still recommend people have a look at uh, an article that came out in the New York Times on the 31st of January 1933 called Hitler puts aside aim to be dictator. There's a kind of message there. And where that's relevant to the Taliban is that uh, at the time of the signing of the 29th of February 2020 agreement between the Taliban and the United States, the New York Times published an article over the name of Sirajuddin Haqqani of the Taliban, which uh, contained all sorts of comforting expressions about a commitment to a peace process and belief that there was no military solution uh, to uh, uh, the situations in Afghanistan and everyone had to come together and so on and so forth. Now, I think it's debatable whether he wrote it or whether it was written by someone in the peace industry for him. But nonetheless, the discrepancy between what was contained in that article and uh, the, the behavior of the Taliban thereafter, when as soon as they'd got the American signature on the agreement, they engaged in strategic stalling and showed no interest in anything but a military pursuit of their objectives, means that we have every reason to be extremely wary now of the kind of soothing things that they might be saying when plainly one of their interests is to uh, calm down the international community and try to obtain control of Afghanistan's seat in international organizations, which bodies such as the UN Security Council and, and meetings of foreign ministers had suggested should be denied to them in the light of their behavior. So uh, I don't see any reason whatsoever to give them the benefit of the doubt, given the way in which the Haqqani article was so completely betrayed by the behavior of the Taliban uh, in the period after it was somewhat naively published in a Western outlet. Thank you, colleagues. Um, we have 15 more minutes left for this uh, Q&A session and I'm receiving more questions. Uh, some of the questions have already been responded to by you in to various degrees, but I think uh, there is be benefit uh, in uh, reiterating uh, uh, some of these responses. Um, I have a group of questions uh, which are uh, to the effect, um, can you speak a little bit more to whether and how, if at all, the Taliban have really changed? What evidence is there that suggests they have changed? Um, the Taliban have recently making, been making assurances to the international community. Uh, what do you make of these uh, assurances? Can we take them at their word? What evidence is there to suggest that they will uh, walk, uh, talk the walk? 
Uh, and then I have a question specifically for Bill, uh, but I, I welcome uh, both um, Farhonda and Omar to respond to this question as well, if you will give me one moment. Uh, Bill, in a webinar in late July, uh, you, uh, uh, organized by the AIIA, uh, Victoria, you mentioned that 85% of Afghans have no sympathy for the Taliban. Uh, is this still the case? Can you elaborate on this a little bit? And what would you make of the impacts of any resistance against uh, Taliban, Taliban rule as far as genocide and the potential of uh, politicide is concerned? Okay, uh, let, let me pick up that point and I'll be interested to hear Fahonda and Omar's uh, reflections as well. Uh, the Asia Foundation survey uh, of opinion in Afghanistan that was conducted in 2019 found that 85.1% of respondents had no sympathy whatever for the Taliban. Now, uh, some people in recent days witnessing events in Afghanistan have concluded that there must be more popular support for the Taliban. But what it's vital to do in these circumstances is differentiate between two different senses of support. One is normative support, when people may support a particular group out of a genuine affinity with its values and its ideological orientation. Another is prudential support, where you align yourself with the group, not because you like it, you may actually despise it, but because you feel that something terrible is likely to happen to you or your family if you don't voice support for that particular group. Uh, and uh, the failure to draw this distinction uh, was one of the reasons why people overestimated the strength of the Taliban regime before 2001. As soon as a stronger force appeared over the horizon in 2001, large numbers of people whom the Taliban had thought were supporters proved to be only prudential supporters and switched sides. Similarly, one of the reasons for the collapse that we've witnessed in Afghanistan was that the advertised, much advertised withdrawal of the United States triggered a cascade where people feared that even if they disliked the Taliban, it was not a good idea to be on what increasingly looked like a losing side. Now, that creates a, a somewhat febrile situation on the ground for the Taliban at the moment because... Um, uh, you have a population in which the Taliban do not have a high level of normative popularity. Uh, and you also have a population where there are looming challenges, which, uh, as Omar suggested, the lack of sort of state-like bureaucratic capability uh, on the part of the Taliban may be a real problem. If, for example, you have rocketing food prices because of uh, a collapse in the currency, uh, there are going to be some people who are desperate as a result. Some will be so desperate that they can't do anything but try to survive on a day-to-day -day basis. There'll be other people whose desperation translates into anger. And if that happens, uh, the risk for the Taliban, I think, is not in terms of armed opposition of the sort that we saw from the Mujahideen against the Soviets in the 1980s. It's rather uh, the risk of the kind of contentious politics of demonstrations, protests, and marches, of which we've already seen some signs in Afghanistan and about which Dr. Ibrahimi has written in his research. Uh, and that then becomes a dangerous situation because it's not difficult to envisage uh, panicking Taliban firing on a crowd of 500 and suddenly having a crowd of 5,000 angry people. Uh, and it, that was the sort of situation that led to the Hungarian Revolution in 1956, when the secret police were armed and the public weren't, but the public came out in such large, num large numbers that they simply overwhelmed uh, the secret police. So uh, uh, in that sense, I think it's a more fragile situation still for the Taliban than uh, some of the reporting would suggest. And But that's also why I fear that once international actors uh, have largely moved out, we may see a very aggressive campaign of uh, repression to try to take out in a very targeted fashion people who might be seen as potential future leaders for this kind of activity. Omar Faru. Um, just on, uh, uh, on the change of the Taliban, I would just um, ask our, uh, the person who asked this question to think of, is it the people who are 
submitting and surrendering to the Taliban that gives you that gives us that sense that there's some sort of um, change or is it that the Taliban have readjusted itself to the um, uh, to, to, to what the people want and then going back and seeing especially in the last one week as the Taliban walked uh, to the capital city in Kabul and other major cities you see this massive massive change that is going on from a very small to, to very large uh, people readjust uh, to me look they're resubmitting or, or, or readjusting themselves rather than the Taliban in my talk I talked about this ideological uh, um, entity of the Taliban that does not allow it to be flexible because um, that ideological end of the Taliban, the, the, the fighters and, and, and the, 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 the extreme commanders, the way they think, the way they have been fed with this propaganda, they are the one who would cause harm if the leadership side, even if they think that they have to change themselves or, or adjust and cater to this urbanized population would face backlash. So I think that's the challenge for the Taliban themselves and we are yet to see um, how they would be able to do that from now on. But looking back, they have been able, able to show a change or adjustment in matters that are non-ideological non and mainly um, in, 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 in areas Areas that benefited them in the war. We, we talked about their um, evolution in, te in technology for their propaganda, for their communication, but not so in other, other um, areas that we would like to see. I might ask a, a follow up question, uh, uh, and then I'd like to, uh, to invite Omar back again to respond to some of these questions. In the event there is egregious human rights violations on a mass scale, what do you think, or how do you think the international community and particularly the U United States might respond? Is that for me or for Bill? It's, it's for me or? Uh, it's for the entire panel, but I thought um, Omar uh, might also want to respond to some of the previous questions and this one. I can go with this. I, to be very to be very honest, I don't expect much reaction, at least for the initial term, to happen because we have experience of the 1990s in which Taliban committed a lot of things and nothing happened except the 9-11 changed some things. Today, everybody's focused knowing how the, um, the international somehow work or how the uh, way they behave and stuff. I do not expect much, and, except that there is one factor that somehow makes it different. In the 1990s, Afghanistan was absolutely isolated from the rest of the world. There was no contact, no connection, no media, nothing. And the Taliban and the Pakistanis made absolutely sure that there is very little contact. And the only contact we had in that time was two telephone lines, one in Kandahar, one in Kabul. And you were allowed, and which was the extension of Quetta and Peshawar, and you have to go days ahead to register for five minutes to talk. And that was the only connection we had with the rest of the world. Today, that's a different. I expect that the Taliban al Qaeda, Pakistan, Islam, they're probably going to go and try to cut things again and limit the uh, accessibility. But there is, first, Afghanistan is connected with the world, and second, there is a mass, critical mass of the educated or at least aware Afghans who, know, who are now abroad. And I think they have Afghanistan, I mean, we have all our own networks of reconnecting back to the from the city to the village level and stuff. And I think these things come up. But what to expect from the matches what will come? I do not, to be honest, something. Except unless kind of it goes on and on and on, and then it will change. But I, to be honest, I don't. And in terms of Taliban popularity and like people talks about it, like they're very popular and stuff, like I completely concur with um, 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 Dr. Meili, in a sense that when we see the whole reemergence of Taliban, the way they operate, I mean, if you put all the factors from like the incredibly incompetent Afghan government run by diaspora without no understanding of how things works, very corrupt and incompetent, a very kind of disillusioned and sort of confused international community will not know what exactly what to do, a very sort of a cunning and uh, Taliban, uh, Pakistan, and the safety basis and the staff, they all, and the only factor that's actually missing in the whole kind of what kind of the, what the Afghans thought and the professor actually mentioned it. So the Taliban came to took over and stuff, but their popularity, they, I mean, one thing about the psychology of an Afghans, and I don't want to generalize here, is like, if you don't deliver, then you're going to pay, 
back. So I, I mean, we'll see what we're talking about. My understanding is an outfit that they will not be able to do much except terror, further terror and further reliance. And that the more they push the population, that's might be the more reliant on the foreign actors. Just remember in 2001, as much as they see Afghans, the commander of the Taliban forces in the North, which was the main front, was Jumana Mangani from Uzbekistan and from 60,000 Taliban fighting in the North, 40,000 were either Arab, Pakistani, Central Asian armies. So I, we will wait and see, but I actually don't expect the internationals to react very much on that. It's once this kind of a hype of the Kabul airport is finished and that's pretty much it, yeah. I might uh, follow that up, your response, Omar, with a question for the entire panel, but uh, uh, also for uh, Professor Maley. Um, Bill, I'm, I'm going to put two questions in together because I think they uh, dovetail and also because um, it, it, they dovetail with Omar's response. Uh, does the international community have a responsibility to protect and how do they go about uh, enacting that uh, uh, protection, um, which is, a, I suppose, a follow-on question from uh, Omar's response. Uh, but also, um, I have another question for you, um, an issue that warrants attention, and this is for the entire panel, an issue that warrants attention is the inability of the international community to have deployed systems uh, to identify and address early signs of politicide and genocide. Uh, how can we uh, uh, address uh, uh, this uh, uh, shortcoming? Thank you, Sir Enjoy. Uh, on the former question about responsibility to protect, of course, this is an idea which originated in 2001 with the report of the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty, which was concerned with circumstances in which mass atrocity crimes uh, required an international response. Uh, part of the problem is that coherent as that idea was, it was somewhat watered down in the final formulation which was adopted uh, within the United Nations, which gave um, a prime role to the Security Council, uh, which of course could easily be deadlocked in responding to any kind of mass atrocity crime in Afghanistan. So although it's rhetorically useful as a way of highlighting uh, problems that may be equivalent to genocide, uh, nonetheless it doesn't necessarily provide any guarantee of a coherent international response. And I, I agree with uh, Omar that I think that the international community is uh, unlikely to be uh, willing to do very much. If one thinks of earlier genocides just uh, in uh, within the lives of people currently living, the Holocaust, the Cambodian genocide, the Rwandan genocide, the scandal associated with each and every one of those was that uh, although there were warning signs there, it was only really after the genocide had been accomplished that people uh, did anything much or wrung their hands. And I well remember that Cambodia was shut down so effectively between 1975 and 1978 that a whole range of leftists were setting out to discredit the testimony of refugees who were providing as they crossed the Thai Cambodia border, very detailed and as it turned out, entirely accurate accounts of what was going on within Cambodia. So the dangers that can flow from shutting down information flows in these circumstances are very, very uh, significant. Now, the second, remind me of the second question in three words. trying to unmute myself. Uh, I think the second question was, um, what, what are some of the shortcomings in recognizing and identifying? Oh, yes, yes. Identifying well, there are general problems, I think, associated with acting on early warnings, whether we're talking about early warnings of genocide, early warnings of armed conflict, early warnings of refugee movements, and the, the endemic and probably uh, inexorable problem is that the warnings are probabilistic rather than deterministic. They do not show with absolute certainty that something is going to happen because human agency is involved. So um, there's always the danger that politicians will shy away from acting on early warnings because they think it might be a waste of resources to do so, since it's not absolutely certain that the problem that one is highlighting will materialize. Uh, and resources are scarce, they can be uh, used in alternative ways by political leadership. So particularly of putting an appropriate 
response to an early warning um, is going to cost uh, money or resources. It's easy for people to shy away and then wring their hands and express sorrow at some later point when it's turned out that early warning might have um, uh, properly uh, uh, handled, might have saved lives. But this, this is, I think, uh, a problem of the nature of politics in general, rather than just being a, a problem that relates to, to, to ge genocide. Getting people to act on early warning is very, very difficult. Um, Omar, Farah, would you uh, like to say anything by way of conclusion before we move on to the next panel? Farah John, if you want to go ahead. I haven't got anything to add at this time. Thank you. Sure. Um, no. uh, I just want to. Sorry, Omar. Please. No, no. I'm just. Was, uh, I, I wanted to say that uh, we are in a very critical situation right now, in which Afghanistan is kind of seen as again a lost cause and stuff, and Taliban are like seen as something like suddenly back to legitimate thing, just like 1996 have happened. But I think that um, if we not kind of keep engaged with Afghanistan in this specific period of time and just say that it's done, finished, uh, whatever may happen, I think we actually see consequence of the problem of Afghanistan being spread all around the region, which I believe definitely will happen, but might cause much more damage to the world than ever before. That's my conclusion on that. Thank you, panelists. Uh, I want to remind uh, the audience that I, we have been receiving your questions and there's only so many we can answer. There are a great many questions of import uh, that we have identified and we will be asking in the second uh, 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 question and answer session. Um, so please be patient with, uh, with us. We will get to your questions. Um, at this stage, we've reached the half hour mark of this we webinar. I'd like to introduce the second uh, uh, group of panelists. Um, uh, uh, to start off, we have uh, Dr. Ir Niamath Ibrahimi, who is lecturer in international relations at La Trobe uh, University and is the author of the book, The Hazaras and the Afghan State. Uh, we also have Ms. Uh, Mariam Popal Zahid, who is a refugee and gender rights activist. She is the founder and director of Afghan Women on the Move, which a, a, an organization which works to create a safe platform for women as survivors of war and trauma. And finally, we have Dr. Nemath Bijan, who is lecturer in public policy at the Development, uh, Development Policy Center at the ANU. He is the author of the book, Eight Paradoxes in Afghanistan, and has extensive experience working in the public sector in Afghanistan. I might start, uh, welcome panelists, and I might start with uh, Nemath Ibrahimi. Uh, Nemath, um, Perhaps at this stage, it is opportune for us to identify and discuss the groups and communities in Afghanistan who are particularly vulnerable to the dangers of politicide and genocide. Thank you, Dr. Sinjay Bose and everybody else, uh, the speakers before me. I would like to just build on what, what uh, previous speakers said. Let us just assume that the Taliban is a, is a totalitarian fundamentalist movement that is seeking to impose its version of Islam on the Afghan society. And the Afghan society is also a hugely complex, pluralistic, and diverse society as well. Um, and Afghanistan is quite diverse in its ethno-linguistic composition and also uh, in its political orientation over the past 20 years we have seen those sorts of political pluralism manifesting at itself through the emergence of a very dynamic civil society, contentious politics that I have studied from my doctoral thesis, and also women groups in Afghanistan. So what are some of the groups that are particularly uh, vulnerable to politicide and genocide? I think what we are witnessing right now in Afghanistan is a politicide happening in front of our eyes. The Afghan political class, the Afghan intellectual class, Afghanistan's cultural class is being decimated in front of our eyes. The Afghan women are fearful now for their life, for their security, for their fundamental human rights and dignity right now at the moment in front of our eyes. The effect of this on Afghanistan as a country is devastating. We should see that Afghanistan is entering at this fifth decade of violence and instability. 
And you know, the same thing happened during the 1990s. Afghanistan lost its intellectual capital. Afghanistan lost its civil society and many groups because of the Taliban violence and repression during those years. And the same thing is happening now. Over the past 20 years, we saw a new generation of Afghans across the country finding an opportunity to break a normal life, to build a new career, to express their political views and expressions. And now, with the departure of tens of thousands of Afghans, either through Kabul airport or across Afghanistan's uh, in the land routes to other countries, we see that group is just being crushed in front of our eyes. And this is the magnitude of this, I think we should really not understand. And what are some of the groups that are particularly vulnerable? I think you know, women are, I think, really at high risk. What the Taliban and the center of ideology is posing as a risk is you know, number one is Afghan women. I mean, the Afghan woman is the victim of a gender apartheid. I mean, we know from the Taliban rule from 1996 to 2001 that they repress women you know, in all social, public, and political sphere of the Afghan life. And they are, as if we're speaking now, haven't really shown any willingness to accept and respect the presence and dignity of the Afghan women in any sphere of the Afghan society. And other groups that are most vulnerable, I think are the groups that are the minorities, that are most different from the Taliban's ideology, either uh, politically or uh, in terms of religion uh, and, and political activities. And I think the Hazaras here stands out as the group for a number of different reasons. First, because of the history of the Taliban, we saw uh, in the 1990, uh, from 1996 to 2001, the Taliban committed a series of genocidal massacre of the Hazaras. For those of us who live in Afghanistan, we know the source of repression the Taliban subjected the Hazaras with during those years. And I think Bill Mali already mentioned that August 1998, mass killing of the, the Hazaras, which resulted to killing of several thousand people within a number of days. And we are also seeing in recent years and months in Kabul, a series of genocidal attacks that were perpetrated, directly targeting the Hazara civilians, you know, Hazara places of worships, schools, civil society groups, they all came under attack. I have in my background you know, a virtual uh, a photo of the school which came under attack on May of this year. Nearly 100 school girls were killed in, uh, in two suicide bombing, and two car bombing. Until today, we really don't know who are responsible for that. Was it the ISIS, the Islamic State, as it is often claimed, or was it the Taliban or sections of the Taliban that were collaborating with ISIS? Okay? And we see this in that danger of genocide targeting the Hazaras based on their ethnic identity, religious affiliation, as a Shia group, and you know, that is distinctive enough for an ideological group like the Taliban, is really eminent and really high uh, possibility there. But at the same time, we should also uh, keep in mind that the Hazaras are also, groups like the Hazaras are also susceptible and vulnerable to uh, politicize because of their political stance over the past 20 years. It was groups like the Hazaras, the minorities, the most persecuted groups that through their faith and trust in the international intervention over the past 20 years. They embraced the democracy, you know, Hazaras were standing out for their participation in democratic processes. Hazara girls were going to schools, universities in very large numbers. And now all of those opportunities are taken away from the Hazaras. And that political clause that emerged among the Hazaras is also being crushed, you know, as it is among the other groups as well. And other groups that we should also keep in mind is other smaller minorities in Afghanistan. I think we should you know, think of the Hindus in Sikhs, you know, which was once a very vibrant, uh, important uh, uh, group in, in Afghanistan's social landscape. And over the past 20 years, they were trying to reassert, reestablish their life. And this community came under attack by a number of groups. Some of those attacks were claimed by the Islamic State, and other attacks are really not known. Okay? And we see that group is really being you know, subjected to genocide in front of our eyes. 
you know, a community of several thousand people is now reduced only to a few hundred or and smaller than that. So because of that, I think we should really stay engaged and focused. And my own concern is that the international uh, uh, community, the United States and its NATO allies are trying to evacuate their citizens, their close allies. Okay. The Taliban will maintain, uh, will try to send a positive message. You know, all of this talks about amnesty uh, and, and other, uh, other statements that they are making will not be able to translate into action. And I think if the Taliban are really genuine, really genuine about offering a new pathway for political settlement in Afghanistan, they should start right now by appointing a senior Afghan woman to a position of authority or reinstate you know, some of those brilliant Afghan women who are in positions of authority in their, in their positions. We know from reports that are coming consistently across Afghanistan, many of those women are pushed back, that they are denied entry into their offices, you know, and Afghanistan's radio television network, Afghan women are sent back, they are not allowed to enter their offices. And we also know from evidence that is coming quite consistently is that the Taliban are also maintaining quite a watchful eye on these groups. They are trying to uh, identify who they are, they have been knocking on people's doors, and I'm really uh, fearful that once the international community withdraws it its own military forces from Afghanistan, it is citizen, there will be something else happening around the world that attention will also shift to other parts of the world. And then it will be the most vulnerable Afghans who will be facing the Taliban um, in, in, uh, without much uh, capacity to resist. I think I might stop here and then we'll be happy to, to participate in the Q&A. Um Niamat, I might just ask a couple of follow-up questions because I think it dovetails with um, what a lot of uh, audience members have been asking during the previous session. And before we move on to uh, uh, Mariam and Niamat to talk about Australia and the international community response to this crisis, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, what we know or don't know about the Taliban that tells us something about how they are likely to govern women and women's issues uh, going into the future. And also perhaps you could uh, uh, tell us a little bit about um, a feature of um, authoritarian regimes, which is they need, they, they, they need legitimacy but, and they try to seek it. Um, and they try to elicit legitimacy because the societies that they govern uh, it, are socioeconomically diverse and plural, at a point that you have touched upon, a point that Omar has touched upon. Um, has there been much socioeconomic change of Afghan society over the past 20 years? Uh, and how might a more diverse and plural society change the Talib or influence the Taliban's mode of rule and conduct, uh, uh, thereby uh, ensuring uh, politicide and genocide isn't taking place? Well, I think uh, I would like to, uh, you know, just follow up um, on what was said earlier. I mean, there are a lot of speculations about a Taliban number two. There is a new version of the Taliban. I think this is a message that was coming from Doha for many years now, and a message that was also received well uh, by some Western uh, actors in Afghanistan because it was also trying to uh, legitimize and justify. Um, um, a political decision to disengage from Afghanistan. But now what are the barometers against which we can also assess the Taliban's change? I think at one level, I think it's obvious the Taliban has changed. I think there are some important ways we can see that the Taliban are a lot more sophisticated. Here is a new generation of Taliban that is media savvy. In my view, they have perfected the art of public relations and appropriating it from the NATO and US forces in Afghanistan. They see it as information psychological operations uh, and they are quite effective uh, in, in, in sending that message quite um, uh, effectively across Afghanistan. But we should also see that the Taliban as a movement has eyes on several constituencies when it is trying to maintain its legitimacy. 
on one level, they are trying to send a positive message to the international community because they need some level of recognition from the international community for them to be able to maintain their home and power in Afghanistan. But they are also trying to stay legitimate in the eyes of the jihadists. I think this was a point that was very well made by Dr. Omar Sharifi. I think they have got jihadist allies who are with them in Afghanistan, and there are jihadist allies in other countries around the world who have been celebrating their victories. So Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda affiliates from Jabhat to Nusa or Hayat al Sham across the Middle East region. They have been celebrating Taliban victory. Are the Taliban leaders flexible enough to embrace changes that will make them look as they are selling out on their core ideological values and principles? And there's also, I think, in my view, we should also see the Taliban as, in, as an ideological force that is, I think, totalitarian in the sense that they don't see a difference between the Taliban as a movement and the Islamic Emirate or the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan as a state. Now you see that happening now, uh, you know, when they try to make this negotiation with certain individuals across Afghanistan, they are trying to secure by act. Pledge of allegiance. Right. That means that if someone is pledging allegiance, they are also becoming a Taliban. That includes, by the way, a brother of former President uh, Ashraf Bani Hashbat. Okay. It doesn't indicate that there is a new political opening in which these actors will be participating as part of the broader Afghan state, a, a broader political settlement. And at the same time, I think we should also be quite um, careful of how this, those different uh, factions and networks within the Taliban also work. I think it was usefully captured by a description of uh, the Taliban by Thomas Rothick, when he called it a network of networks. Okay. The Taliban, there are networks within it, and the Taliban itself is embedded, embedded within the broader transnational jihadist networks, even though they may not have any sorts of transnational ambitions of their own in the sense of trying to uh, in a cross borders into Central Asia or South Asia, but they have got important ideological, social, and cultural linkages that they have been built with these other groups over so many years. And I think the Taliban, even if the political Taliban try to decide to make a political decision, they will face immense challenges trying to speak to this very different contradictory constituency, both in Afghanistan, but also internationally. Thanks, Nehmat, for that uh, very detailed explication. I think um, your responses complement some of what uh, Farhonda was uh, uh, discussing as well, particularly your observation on the transnational connections, because we are now seeing reports emerging, as you point out, that not only are um, uh, uh, individuals uh, 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 and groups uh, celebrating the Taliban victory from Bangladesh all the way to the Middle East, uh, uh, but we are also now receiving reports that um, persons, individuals are actually either leaving or preparing to leave for Afghanistan, ostensibly to either fight for the Taliban or to be part of a Taliban emirate. Um, I'd like to um, change the direction of our conversation now and uh, go to Mariam um, and really talk about uh, what Australia has been doing in, in immediate terms of responses, uh, what it can be doing for the short and medium term, what it should be doing. Uh, Mariam, I suppose, I've already asked you my question, but I suppose if I had to uh, rephrase, my question would, would be what are Australia's responsibilities to ensure the protection of those deemed vulnerable and most at risk? What is Australia doing and what can and should it do in the coming weeks and months? Uh, thank you, Dr. Sanjay and hello, friends. Um, for me, being a, a woman from, from Afghanistan, uh, have experienced Taliban, have experienced displacement, and know the effect of um, what trauma can do to you being in a new country, the resettlement programs, all of them can have an impact or an, and uh, and I will, will tell the resettlement of um, 
when you wanted to either bring Afghans or rescue them to a safer country, or you deliver resources, aids, and everything back home as an immediate um, uh, rescue uh, package. And we have 35 million people in Afghanistan, 5 million of them are displaced. We have 100,000 people here in Afghanistan. Most of them are from refugee and migrant backgrounds. So for Australia, uh, uh, at the moment, uh, we all have been taken by surprise to um, how Taliban uh, came in power, um, yet for us to adjust and, and uh, accept uh, the reality that Taliban uh, are, are in power. Uh, so for the immediate actions that we have been doing, uh, these conversations uh, were effective and we are making some, some, uh, uh, some impact on our talking with our politicians, uh, talking our, with our aid uh, organizations that we are um, working on some sort of streamlining some projects and uh, for immediate delivery and uh, short and long um, aid for Afghanistan. The question here is for all of us to ask, how do we coordinate these projects? How we can, uh, how we can benefit uh, in, a, in a way that, uh, especially uh, looking at the Afghan women and vulnerable communities, looking at Taliban, um, how, they, how they see foreign aid coming to Afghanistan, will they be looking under uh, their um, ideas of, um, coming from an organization that been working with Afghan women in, in Afghanistan from an empowerment perspective. How do they uh, 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 define empowerment uh, projects or projects working with Afghan women from international community? Uh, can we persuade them? Can we speak to them? Can we convey a message that uh, we, are, uh, we are not at the moment um, are doing anything else other than just to help the, 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 the civilians not to die in Afghanistan because there are shortage of food there, the banks are closed, the, the shops are closed, and that will not, that can continue for the next couple of uh, weeks and, and, and months. Uh, and uh, what we hear from Taliban at the moment uh, that, that the governments are taking shape and we have to wait. Uh, we shouldn't assume, we shouldn't, we shouldn't you know, go, go too much negatives about Taliban. We hear even from our communities here that stop um, being so negative about uh, what they will do or what they won't do. But from what I have experienced myself and the people that I'm currently in contact in Australia here, uh, it's very, <clears throat> we, are, we are not very sure that, Afghan, that Taliban will give Afghan women and Afghan civilians a platform to be part of the forming government. Tomorrow I have a, um, I had, um, I have had a um, um, uh, event organized uh, and I had um, a minister of women uh, um, invited to come and speak to, to our um, Australian audience. But now I, can, I couldn't even find her. And um, for, for, uh, for Taliban, to, to come in power in such and such force. Uh, they can now deny and make us wait for months and months uh, to make a decision about women participation and the government. We don't want to be victim of their political movement to sit down again and take years for us to uh, advocate and fight for our rights. So from international community perspective and the Afghans that here, that multicultural communities here, we need to align, we need to coordinate our messages. We need to make sure that you know, we are still in contact with Afghan women in Afghanistan. We are even to um, having now Taliban in power to be in contact with the authorities there to make sure that, uh, to convey a message that they will still will need, need community, international communities to work with them. Uh, there will be a culture clash um, to what the Afghan women has been doing in the past 20 years. And now how the young Afghan men and women will be seeing these, these new cultural aspects of how Taliban want to, uh, according to them, under Islamic law, they will give us uh, our rights. So I will be concerned about um, how many, uh, how much uh, that traditional values of uh, Taliban will impact uh, the contemporary approach that Afghan, Afghan women, Afghan young boys and, and girls here. My concern is not just, just about 
women there, not just about women here in, in Australia or international communities. We are talking about the, 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 the kids or the families, the, the people that were growing up in the past 20 years being very exposed to, to social media, to international communities, uh, to know what their rights are, and all of a sudden to take away everything and bring it under a new form of law. Uh, we all know what kind of type of uh, mentality Taliban has when they when they talk or interpret uh, their um, um, uh, their ideology. Uh, so uh, for Afghan, um, for me, uh, the culture clash will the, if it's not if it, if it's not um, um, uh, considered, it will help. It will damage the psychological and emotional. Um, state of Afghan community uh, here in, in Australia or international communities and also the Afghans there. They might not be uh, dying of bombing or suicides, but they will be different, su different definitely suffering from um, psychological and emotional um, uh, aspect and they, that can kill the, a generation where the Taliban will need uh, to, to function to, to be able to have intellectual uh, uh, of their, uh, their a country to be able to, to form a government. They, they can't have all the religious people uh, in their um, government agencies to, to govern us. They still will be needing diplomats. They still need to have um, doctors. They will see, uh, still need um, artists, social activists, media personalities to be given an opportunity for us to, uh, to, to be in contact with outside world. Uh, one of our speakers uh, said before that Afghanistan were, were in the dark when Taliban was, was there 20, 25 years ago. And it was very difficult for us to communicate with the world that what is happening in Afghanistan and how can we challenge those perceptions. But now we have the social media. Now we already know what, how much Afghanistan has achieved in the past 20 years, how much women have um, shown potential that if the opportunity will be given, they will do a lot more you know, from the organization that I have worked or represent Afghan Women on the Move. We have done many projects that um, if I don't or if I can't, uh, continue working with women there or communities there. It's not just a big loss for, for Afghan community in Afghanistan and Afghan government, but also with the international community. It's a big loss for us to, to lose our friends there. Um, so uh, for international communities, uh, we might um, uh, indefinitely, we have to streamline coordinated projects, resettlement programs, and we must admit that we cannot bring all Afghans out of Afghanistan. Um, so still we will be working with, with Afghan, uh, Afghanistan and Afghans there, but that shouldn't be a conversation of um, in the next couple of months. It has to start from now because government is taking shape uh, right now. And we have to, women must be part of that conversation, that forming uh, governance that they wanted to implement um, because, um, uh, it, it will be a waste of time if we have to start in fighting back on, about our rights uh, with Taliban again. And, and they will, uh, and Taliban now facing the, the, the community, the people in Afghanistan, if not, um, they have to, um, they, they must uh, prove themselves to the people of Afghanistan. Uh, because international communities can only hear from what on the media some of them will say, what the Taliban that on the ground will behave with the communities there, what will happen behind the scene, that is more, that's more important. And we will be looking at what is in action on the ground, not what we will be hearing from their political uh, uh, speeches and, and uh, figures. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mariam. I, you've touched on so many critical aspects. You've, you've problematized an issue that, um, all of the panelists have uh, spoken of, uh, spoken about variously, the, the Taliban lacking the capacity to govern and the implications of such of that on um, a, 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 you know a, issues in politicide and genocide among a whole host of other things. And you've also highlighted the issues of foreign aid and so on and so forth. I I see that a number of our audience members have questions on foreign aid and. Questions to do with uh, uh, you know a, a looming culture clash. 
so to speak. But I just want uh, uh, to follow up very quickly, if you will, in a minute or so, this your emphasis on coordination. What for you would be a best and worst case scenario that might be anticipated in some of the sectors uh, uh, in Afghanistan in terms of, let's say, health and education in particular? What can we do uh, as an immediate um, help in Afghanistan is to, um, we have to go quickly on, on the international uh, cash delivery. At the moment, banks are closed. Uh, Western Union, just for an example to give, every uh, transactions to go in Afghanistan at the moment are, 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 are not functioning. So how can I think international communities working with, uh, on the ground with Afghanistan, that people are literally dying from hunger, how do we uh, coordinate that with our uh, uh, international aids that, that they have a quite bigger reach uh, internationally uh, to, be, to deliver um, aids in Afghanistan. At the moment, nothing has been done. No aid has been uh, delivered and to the displaced people in Afghanistan. Um, so as much as we are talking about the visa crisis and, and only humanitarian resettlements and everything else, but as I have to say that uh, that five million that are displaced, um, there's no, not a coordinated project or, or a streamline to, to deliver aids from anywhere. Thank you so much for that, Mariam. Uh, Neymar uh, Bijan, if I might turn to you as our last panelist before opening up um, the session once again to Q&A. Um, I suppose I have a very general uh, question, uh, which uh, I hope complements uh, what uh, uh, Mariam has been speaking to. In terms of the immediate and short term, what can and should the international community and the UN be doing to ensure protection? Dr. Boss and colleagues here, thank you and also Hi and salam to, to the all uh, wonderful audience. Uh, I would like to start uh, with a statement that Afghanistan is the mirror of the world. And we hope they can see what's happening in Afghanistan. Uh, before coming to what the international community can do, uh, I would like to add that in the last two decades, the role of the US and as allies has been paradoxical and building the state which perpetuated the state weakness and then in the peace building process which expedited the collapse in Afghanistan. I'm shocked uh, and everyone is shocked to what's happening in Afghanistan, it's a tragedy. Someone was telling me the other day when I was talking in Afghanistan by saying, we trust no one. That's the degree of trust in Afghanistan among people. Let's um, not talk about different political actors. That's the situation. The international community lost this leverage in Afghanistan, the US and NATO they could do a much better job in terms of the transition and in terms of the withdrawal, which they failed. Of course, the government and the leadership had its own problems and weaknesses. Now we are here, it's a new reality. Afghanistan is um, captured by the Taliban. Uh, it's a new reality. How can we work around that? And how can we mitigate the existing humanitarian crisis from deepening? So I would like to outline few issues that the international community still can do to mitigate the, uh, the, the existing crisis from deepening. Um, so I would uh, divide them into two, the immediate ones. And then this in the and the medium to long long term. At the moment, we are uh, experiencing a, a tragedy in Afghanistan. What the international community do is to offer protection to those who are vulnerable and are at a greater risk 
inside Afghanistan. Saying that the first issue that we are experiencing at the moment is happening now in Afghanistan is the evacuation of those people who are at risk. And even the, the, the international community or the allies ha have not been able to manage the evacuation properly. It's a crisis. What's happening uh, in the Kier, uh, Kabul airport is not acceptable. So two issues can be done with that. The first one is to prolong the evacuation deadline, give more time to people. And the second one I would suggest is that after the existing arrangement has expired, let the UN to take a lead role and those people who are at risk to evacuate. That's one thing. And the most important, the other one, the important part is increasing the intake of refugees, Afghan refugees on the humanitarian basis to offer protection. And that one has two components. The first one is immediately those Afghans who have already um, sub, uh, requested protection and they are stuck in limbo, they should be given protection. They should not be deported back to Afghanistan. And the second one is to increase the intake. So to, to, to offer protection to more people from Afghanistan, it's sad that we are losing the brightest, those who would um, help Afghanistan to, to change, to develop, but it's a sad moment for Afghanistan, we are watching and we are advocating for that. What's happening now, what I mean, I would call it like the international community or those countries, who worked with Afghanistan, the way they are treating it is um, somehow underestimating the, the crisis. How? Let me give you the example of Australia offering 3,000 visas for protection, which is highly bureaucratized. How can someone in this crisis wait for a few years to, to go to a safe place? That's that's somehow humiliating to have funds. And somehow, when I hear that, uh, I was shocked that the, the visa system in Australia is highly bureaucratized. Second, someone should go to, to, to a second country. How that can happen? The borders are closed. The neighbors are not allowing the funds to go to another country. It's an exceptional situation in Afghanistan. So, I would say it's a time to look at the realities, what's happening on the ground. And then coming to another immediate issue that we're experiencing in Afghanistan is uh, a humanitarian crisis. We have thousands and even close to a million internally displaced uh, people in Afghanistan. And also services are cut to do who are in need. So we can see the disruption of public services in Afghanistan. Most of the institutions virtu virtually um, have collapsed in Afghanistan. What about people? Uh, it's, it's concerning because the international humanitarian injuries are not uh, operating now in Afghanistan. There is need for continued humanitarian assistance to look after those people. But the problem would be in the past, I was arguing that it's better to put money or give money to, to the government and to spend foreign aid to, to the government budget. But now I would advocate, no, it's better to work through non-state actors, humanitarian organizations. That's another um, option because what's happening around 18 million or half of the population, they're at, at risk at the moment. They're suffering from poverty. And that number will increase because uh, people not, are not able to work. The economy is in a state of collapse. Moving from these immediate uh, interventions or initiatives, so coming to a more immediate, immediate medium-term or longer-term ones, 
would be, what about the government in Afghanistan? What about the values in Afghanistan? How the new government would look like? So colleagues discussed about, um, about the prospects for, for future government in Afghanistan. That's uncertain. Why we worry here? I saw some of the questions people are asking why you're worrying too much. When we predict the future of an organization or actor, basically we go and look at what ha has happening in the past based on the, uh, I mean, uh, past behavior, we can predict the future. So looking at what was happening under the Taliban as an insurgent movement, and then as, uh, as a um, government, I was living in Afghanistan. So that's why uh, people are worried and the future is uncertain. In that regard, disengaging will, from Afghanistan will not be a viable option, rather than better to engage and try to, the international community still can put pressure to protect the fundamental rights of citizens. That's, that's very important why a woman should be banned from edu edu access to education or work and these kinds of issues. And then coming to another point that's um, human rights. Also concerning uh, uh, engagement, there will be need for uh, continued monitoring of violation of human rights in Afghanistan. Because the, the question now is, what about chain narrative of the Taliban? Is it uh, really happening in practice? That needs to be monitored. And then coming to another issue, still the international community has a responsibility. Shall we uh, experience another cycle of violence in Afghanistan? So that requires uh, extensive diplomatic efforts still. If there's a chance, it should be pushed to, um, uh, to encourage the, the formation of a more inclusive uh, system which can respect the fundamental rights of people uh, from all walks of life in Afghanistan. What I would like to... Um, say at the end is that the leverage of the international community is limited. What we are making the case is now is for protection, for main maintaining or pro protecting them, the minimal, uh, I mean, gains uh, or the gains we had uh, in Afghanistan. And um, coming to, to the last sentence, I would say, uh, I'm worried uh, because unexpected changes may happen again in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you, Nimat, for uh, another um, sobering analysis. Um, I suppose the circumstances dictate um, that they will be, by definition, sobering. Um, I want to press the panel now. Um, uh, to, uh, we only have about 20 more minutes left, so I, uh, or 15 minutes left, so I'd like to invite um, all our panelists uh, to answer some of these uh, questions. Um, Nemat Bijan, at the very end, you, you mentioned or you problematized how the international community and Australia can go about engaging with um, the Taliban, with the peoples of Afghanistan, with the government, in whatever form it takes, and how we can uh, work towards protecting uh, human rights and preventing mass atrocities. And you also po pointed out that it's difficult. We don't have that much leverage. Um, so my question uh, to you all, and these are uh, audience questions, uh, are the following. Uh, the speakers today have all mentioned that continued humanitarian assistance and engagement is needed within Afghanistan. But who is responsible in providing this? Is a collective responsibility the way forward? Adding on to that question, many have identified uh, 
regional politics as a key uh, uh, diplomatic factor? What is the role of China, Iran, Pakistan, and other uh, countries in the region in, in terms of providing humanitarian aid and assistance, but also in terms of uh, 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 pressuring the, uh, the Taliban away from committing uh, 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 politicide and genocide. Perhaps we'll start with these two questions and then I'll come back for more questions. The floor is yours, colleagues. Well, if I could just say a little bit about the second question there, Mr. Enjoy, the, um, uh, the entire outcome of events over the last few months has been, of course, a strategic disaster for the United States, not only in terms of loss of influence um, in a country where the most pro-Western government in the entire region was located, but also in terms of the signal that's been sent to the wider world uh, about the unreliability of the United States as uh, a partner. And in that sense, it would be astounding if the Chinese the Russians and some other regional states didn't seek to exploit the opportunity that's been presented to them on a platter to expand their particular interest in the region. Uh, the danger, of course, is that it's it's not just the influence of those groups that will grow, but also the kind of radical groups that uh, Omar was mentioning in his earlier remarks. And uh, Dr. Hororo Ingram, who's one of the leading specialists on ISIS, has pointed out that an absolutely stable element of ISIS propaganda is that the United States will always betray you, that uh, it can't be trusted. And that's undoubtedly something which will uh, play into the recruiting uh, rhetoric of a group like ISIS, just as radical groups right around the world uh, are potentially going to be stimulated by um, a rhetoric that says that yet again, following what happened when the Soviets withdrew from Afghanistan in 1989, uh, radical religion has managed to defeat even a superpower. So I don't think we should underestimate the strategic ramifications of the failure of the United States um, in Afghanistan. Uh, just on the area of humanitarian assistance, I think uh, it's very important to recognize that the needs of Afghans are tremendous at the moment and they're likely to be rising. But uh, equally, it's important when one delivers aid to ensure that it doesn't, as it were, give effect to what um, the philosopher Avishai Margalit has called a rotten compromise. That is a set of arrangements that entrench abuse and violation of human rights. And so for that reason, I suspect uh, that the point that Nemat Bijan made about uh, not going to sort of replenish a Taliban budget, but instead looking at other avenues such as um, UN agencies, the International Committee of the Red Cross, those kind of bodies that have operational experience in Afghanistan, but can be trusted not simply to um, prop up the Taliban, um, uh, would be the right way in which to proceed. And frankly, I think they also have an administrative capability on the ground in Afghanistan that greatly exceeds what the Taliban would be likely to offer. The Taliban is simply not a bureaucracy with any experience in <laughs> delivering welfare to people their model has always been one of control rather than government. Uh, and uh, to think that they're going to morph into a set of administrative structures that are going to be able to identify the neediest people and ensure that they're protected is just wishful thinking of the dreamiest variety at the moment. Uh, if I may add, uh, Sir Andrew, um... so, Sorry, uh, Nemat, if I... Sure. I, I uh, 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 um... Might I invite Mariam to respond to the, uh, uh, one of the questions first, and then I'll come back to you. Mariam? Sorry, Mariam, you're on mute. Okay, um, in terms of, I just, it's just my own perspectives as well here. In terms of um, international aid delivery, Afghanistan has been a donor receiver for us, as, as far as I remember. Uh, and the, the, the international uh, help that has been given to them for the past 20 years. And before that, we, I remember President George uh, Bush once said that we are helping Afghanistan uh, to help also to, with the, the uh, help to empower women. And there were very particular projects to, to, to be given for women and, and you know, help uh, uh, that from that space, but uh, they were not very impactful. We saw what happened from one Taliban to another Taliban and women disappeared again. So we don't want this um, political, um, politi uh, these um, help be politicized again and 
sending millions and billions of dollars again uh, to the new government, whoever will be, um, uh, without a condition. There has to be a very um, strict condition on why we are sending them if when it, the big money goes. We as a smaller organization, we do aid deliveries and we feed, feed people on the ground. But when it goes to the bigger money, it has, it has to have a structure, it has to have a condition, and it has to have given as a result. And we have to be able to directly um, uh, be speaking to the uh, donor receivers rather than um, uh, hearing uh, of just from the news or their political um, figures. Um, so um, at this time, uh, um, we must look into uh, not to make also Afghanistan uh, always dependent on, uh, there has to be some stabilities, there, there has to be some, some sort of um, uh, the empowerment, the real empowerment, uh, if, if that is um, going to be a, a long-term uh, government or, or, or a, a, you know, whatever. I, I just can't even call them a government. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, I would probably will very much uh, be um, emphasizing and pushing for a very structural um, uh, funding uh, streamline uh, when this time anybody will help Afghanistan because um, there will be a couple of uh, platforms will be playing here a role and we don't want to be uh, just in the name of women or the name of the civilians the money goes and disappears and rich gets richer and poor gets poor thanks sure uh, uh Nima Bijan and then uh Nima Ibrahim uh coming to the relationship between the upcoming government in Afghanistan and, and the international community concerning the legitimacy factor, especially now there is at least three layers. The first one is between the Taliban and the society. Let's not forget that Afghanistan society has transformed in the last two decades. So we have a much stronger society in Afghanistan than we had in the 1990s. So already we are observing the, the clash of values between the Taliban and the new generation in Afghanistan. The second layer would be a settlement between the Taliban and the elites, like elite settlement. And the third one will be between the upcoming government, anyone, in case if there's a chance of settlement in the international community. In case if there is a failure, uh, so it would be less likely that Afghanistan will receive aid in the future because it will be based on certain conditions and public services basically would collapse in Afghanistan because a large portion of uh, government budget was funded through foreign aid in Afghanistan. So legitimacy factor is quite important and also in Afghanistan, uh, it takes time for people to react. So we shouldn't uh, uh, be surprised if we hear more about uh, changes in provinces in the, uh, in the upcoming months in Afghanistan. It will depend how would the, the actors negotiate and renegotiate about the power arrangement in Afghanistan. Nima? Uh, you're on mute. I will just be following up from what other colleagues said uh, to make a, a couple of quick points. The first is regarding the Taliban likelihood of committing mass atrocity crime in Afghanistan. I think here, while the international leverage by Western countries are declining, we should also remember that the influence of countries in the region are increasing. I think with that power comes responsibility. I think this is a message I think we should be communicating quite clearly to everyone. I think countries that are in the region, they have any influence on the Taliban. We know a lot of these countries found a common interest with the Taliban in fighting the United States, not necessarily because they wanted the Taliban to rule Afghanistan, but because they wanted to challenge the United States. But anyway, all of those countries have got liaison, connections to the Taliban. They have to use those connections to make sure the Taliban um, for the inclusive government, 
and does not commit mass atrocity crimes in Afghanistan. Second, I think the dilemma of providing aid to Afghanistan controlled by the Taliban is very similar to other similar situations. You know, authoritarian regimes that are repressive, uh, you know, always present a challenge. What sort of aid you can provide that will not strengthen the power and the capacity of the ruling regime, but at the same time, it reaches out to other people. I mean, we have in mind North Korea, you know, you know Syria, and a lot of other countries that come to mind now, right? If you impose sanctions, you will have both the state and the civilians, right? But at the same time, while it is important to keep in mind that in a humanitarian assistance must be rich, I think it's really, really critical. The IDPs, internally displaced people, I think some questions were raised here in the chat, but should also remember that the Taliban will not necessarily be opposed to all forms of international assistance. Even in the 1990s, they welcomed NGOs that provide services that alleviated the pain and the suffering of the Afghans under their rule. You know, because these were areas they could not fulfill those functions, right? Now, it is likely assuming the Taliban holds is in control and power, I think they would like those sorts of civil society NGOs to operate, I think, in Afghanistan. But those sorts of other NGOs that are demanding accountability, advocacy NGOs, human rights promotion NGOs, I think these are the sorts of groups that we will be most concerned about. Thank you. Sure. I might... Uh, uh... Uh, let uh, Professor William Maley have the last word because I can see his hand up uh, as well. And I suspect he might want to say something about Pakistan over here as well because there have been some questions about Pakistan along with China. Uh, Bill. Uh, yes, I hadn't planned to say uh, much about Pakistan, but I think it's becoming increasingly clear that the structure of the military campaign uh, in Afghanistan in recent times uh, and the provisioning of the attackers uh, was very much the product of a conventional military uh, organization rather than uh, simply a group of uh, uh, of uh, armed gangs wandering around the country. And uh, um, I think, frankly, one could call it a creeping invasion by Pakistan, um, which uh, uh, even uh, Tony Blair in his recent comments has identified as having been a critical supporter of the, the Taliban. And of course, he would have had access to the highest level intelligence about that when he was the British Prime Minister. There are a couple of points that I just wanted to make uh, in conclusion. One is on this question of what responsibilities that uh, might be owed to Afghanistan by international players. I think the fundamental source of responsibilities here is promises. International actors time and time again said to people in Afghanistan that they would not be abandoned, that the international community would stand by Afghanistan. And the old principle, Pacta Sant Savan, the promises should be kept, kicks in as a very fundamental moral um, issue here, uh, that when you make that kind of promise and people then put themselves in risky situations because they believe you, don't turn around at some point in the future and say, oh, you were na naive to believe what we were saying. Uh, you know, that is the ultimate immoral cop-out under these circumstances, and it's something which uh, really deserves a, 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 a stark response uh, when politicians say that kind of thing. Frankly, politicians who, having urged Afghans to defend freedom and democracy and that kind of thing, and now want to walk away and leave them in flames as a result, simply deserve to be spat on. Uh, and the other comment I'd make in conclusion is this, that I do think it's very important that at this stage we push back against the kind of orientalist tropes about Afghanistan that are being trotted out from all sorts of directions. Uh, I'm going to scream if I hear someone yet again quote uh, Kipling from the 19th century, a poet who never once set foot in Afghanistan as a source of insight into an Afghanistan in the 20, 21st century, which as other members of the panel have pointed out, has been exposed to all sorts of transformative influences in the last 20 years. In, through media, through the youth of the population, through socialization experiences no previous people had had. Simplistic claims like Afghanistan is a tribal society, as if that's the key to everything, or claims that Afghanistan is the graveyard of empires, or, or that culture explains everything that we need to know about developments in Afghanistan. These kind of approaches really do not help. They're the mainstay of some of the incident experts on Afghanistan who've surfaced, particularly inside the Beltway in the United States in recent times, 
uh, uh, really try to put the blame on the Afghans for everything that's gone wrong because they supported the election of a Biden presidency and they uh, really don't want to come to terms with well, the, the fact that their hero has feet of clay. But, but um, I, I think from a scholarly point of view, these kind of tropes are a dangerous distraction from understanding the complexities of Afghanistan, which are going to be so central in determining uh, whether the fate of people on the ground um, is as dangerous as a lot of people fear. Uh, thanks for that, Bill. Uh, that actually speaks to one of the, some of the comments, not, not really questions, but some of the comments that we've been receiving uh, that were suggesting Afghanistan and Afghan peoples, particularly youth, are not ready for democracy. If they capitulated so easily to the Taliban, this is the suggestion. I think you have dispelled, I think all panelists today have dispelled of that uh, uh, myth forcefully. Um, friends, colleagues, uh, we are out of time. Uh, the subject matter is somber, sobering. There's a lot to discuss. We could have uh, gone on for hours, uh, but unfortunately we have to conclude the webinar at this stage. Um, the recording will be made available uh, to all of those who, who have registered for this event. Uh, so uh, um, Ari, did you want to say something about how people can access that link and the recording link. Um, I want to take, before I, I let Ari speak, I want to take this opportunity to thank everybody and particularly our panelists and particularly our uh, panelists who have been working round the clock trying to organize evacuations of vulnerable and at-risk peoples and persons. You know who I'm talking about. Um, so thank you for making the time to join us. Ari, did you want to just tell us um, where and when the link will be available? Sure, thank you very much. So the link to this recording will be available immediately after this event or at our website, which is our uh, uh, policy.crawford.anu.edu.au. So that's our website, policy.crawford.anu.edu.au. The link to this recording will be available immediately after this event. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much, Ari. Uh, well, colleagues, on that note, um, Stay safe wherever you are. Um, so, sorry, I, sorry, I think Farhonda would like to say something. Maybe, oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry, I didn't see your hand raised there. Yeah, yes, or, or, or Mariam, I think, would like to have some, sorry. Some Thank comment. you, Doctor. Just one quick point. I know it's very late um, uh, about the recognition of the Taliban. Um, I would like to raise one, uh, uh, one last point, and that is that the, that the ball is in the court of the Taliban and the court of the international community. And when it comes to the recognition of the Taliban, we have the international community have lost leverage, but it's still um, there are a lot more to be done from from now onward that the Taliban have taken power and that diplomatic recognition of the Taliban, the international community, the region may not be able to, but the broader international community may be able to use its leverage of recognition of the Taliban to um, uh, to to ask for at least the bare minimum of fundamental right uh, fundamental rights of the Afghan civilian in return for their diplomatic re recognition. This goes back to the UN and then to the Security Council. And we as individuals um, and as, uh, as state members can play our role in that. And please do everything you can in your capacity to influence that decision, because everybody else is holding that recognition right now just to see what would unfold. But our request is to make sure that is in exchange to at least some sort of uh, basic and fundamental um, recognition of the rights of the Afghan people. Yeah, I'll end with that. I think uh, Farhanda, you've encapsulated that very well. I don't think I can add anything to that. I think we should end on that note uh, um, on, and on your observation there. Uh, once again, colleagues, thank you oh, so much. Marianne, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Oh, do we have another hand? Oh, okay, sorry, no, no, okay, sorry. All right, if there aren't any more um, comments, um, thank you uh, audience members for your questions, for your engagement. Thank you for joining us. Thank you participants uh, for making the time to uh, have this very urgent discussion. Uh, stay safe wherever you are and have a good evening. Thank, thank you, Dr. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. everyone.